Well, hello and good Monday morning to you. I'm Scott Fisher, and this morning I'm filling in for my good friend, Don K. Preston, and his morning musings. This is my musings of a Texas preacher man. As those of you who are regular followers of Don's morning musings know, Don's been battling a recovery from strep throat for the past two months. His doctor has urged him to give his vocal cords a break, and he's asked me to step in for him this week. Now, I've been in the midst of a study of the New Covenant the covenant established by Jesus, the promised Messiah of Israel, and Savior of the whole world. We've been seeing that the Old Testament prophecies of a coming Messiah, Messianic kingdom, and new covenant find their fulfillment in Jesus. In fact, as we've seen, and we will continue to see throughout this study, the text of the Old Testament serves as source material for Jesus and the New Testament writers. Today, we'll continue our study in the book of Hebrews at chapter 4. And if this is your first visit with me, I hope you'll continue on. Last week, we were in the first three chapters of Hebrews and saw that they set the stage for the development of the theme of Jesus as the high priest of their faith. The contrast between the house of Moses and the house of Jesus, the Levitical priesthood and the priesthood of Melchizedek, the old covenant and the new covenant, the first century apostates, and the righteous remnant of faith. The focus on Jesus as the high priest covers from chapters 3 through 7, and the last few verses of chapter 3 deal with the Israelites who came out of Egypt, led by Moses, and the writer of Hebrews states that they were unable to enter the rest because of sin, disobedience, and unbelief. In fact, the three are synonymous. Now, chapter 4 begins with that premise in mind. Verse 1, Therefore, let us fear, if while a promise remains of entering his rest, any one of you may seem to have come short of it. As you've heard Don often state, whenever a passage begins with the word therefore, then what was previously said has bearing on what is now being said. Now, verse 2, For indeed, We have had good news preached to us, just as they also. But the word they heard did not profit them, because it was not united by faith in those who heard. Now again, identifying the pronouns is crucial to understanding Scripture. Paul uses we, us, they, and them. The we and us were the first century followers of Jesus, And the they and them were the Israelites led by Moses out of Egypt and into the wilderness. Now, before we continue, it's going to be important to discuss the rest and the Old Testament typology. Now, before the Israelites were ever enslaved in Egypt, the promise was made to Abraham. That promise centered around what was called the land of promise or the land. The enslaved Israelites were delivered out of bondage, out of Egypt, by the mighty signs and wonders of God and under the leadership of Moses. The Lord established his covenant with them, and we have that enunciated in Leviticus chapter 26 and Deuteronomy chapter 28. The goal of their journey out of Egypt was to enter the land of promise. Now, I contend that the promise made to Abraham, which used the land, the geographical boundaries of the Euphrates, the great river, to the Nile, and the Mediterranean Sea to the Persian Gulf, as symbolic for the Messianic kingdom, the heavenly Jerusalem, the new covenant, and it all finds its fulfillment in Jesus. Now, when Jesus began his ministry, he did so performing many miracles, signs, and wonders, just as happened in the Exodus under Moses, which is a type and shadow of what was to come under the Messiah. Now, in one significant miracle performed by Jesus, he healed a lame man at the pool of Bethesda. The man had been lame for 38 years. Each day, this man and many others were taken to the pool. In fact, John says it was a multitude were taken to this pool in hopes of being the first to get in when the waters were stirred by an angel of the Lord. And whoever stepped in first was made well. 
Well, in the story recorded by John, we get a glimpse of Jesus's manner. We pick up the story in John chapter 5 at verse 6. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been a long time in that condition, he said to him, do you want to get well? Now, <laughs> come on. The dude had been taken there for 38 years. Well, verse 7, the sick man answered him, Sir, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up, but while I am coming, another steps down before me. And Jesus said to him, Get up, pick up your pallet, and walk. Immediately, the man became well, and picked up his pallet and began to walk. Now it was the Sabbath on that day. So the Jews were saying to the man who was cured, it's the Sabbath and it's not permissible to carry your pallet. Now this takes us into the very heart of the controversy between Jesus, the promised Messiah of Israel, and the apostate leadership of the first century Jews. Rather than rejoicing in the miracle of a man being healed after 38 years, they were indignant that he was carrying his pallet and even more indignant that he had been healed on the Sabbath day. Now for time's sake, we're going to pick it up at verse 15. The man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him well. For this reason, the Jews were persecuting Jesus because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. But he answered them, my father is working until now, and I myself am working. For this reason, therefore, the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him, because he not only was breaking the Sabbath, but he was calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. Now, this is critical to our study. The Jews accused Jesus of breaking the Sabbath. Jesus responds, my father is working until now and I myself am working. His point is this, how could he be guilty of breaking the Sabbath when the Sabbath had not yet come? Yes, the father established the Sabbath day as a part of the old covenant ritual. But the Sabbath day was symbolic of something far deeper. The Sabbath day was symbolic of the messianic kingdom. And Jesus blew their minds and they were enraged at him. Now let's go back to Hebrews 4 and we'll pick it up at verse 3. For we who have believed... Enter that rest. Just as he has said, as I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest, although his works were finished from the foundation of the world. Now here's another critical point we have to grasp. The verb tenses. The writer speaks in the past tense of those who have believed Speaking of these first century followers of Jesus, the audience of the writer of Hebrews, who, whom he's writing to, and then, quote, his works were finished from the foundation of the world. Speaking of God. Now, hang on to that. We'll pick it back up at verse 4. For he has said somewhere concerning the seventh day, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again, in this passage, they shall not enter my rest. Therefore, since it remains for some to enter it, and those who formerly had good news preached to them failed to enter because of disobedience, he again fixes a certain day. Today, saying through David, after so long a time, just as had been said before, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, he would have not spoken of another day after that. So there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. So we see that on the seventh day, 
God rested from all his works. We see also that his works were finished from the foundation of the world. Yet Jesus said in John chapter 5, my father is working until now, and I myself am working. So how do we resolve all of this? It was done from the foundation of the world because nothing could stop its fulfillment from coming about. It was being implemented in the ministry of Jesus. I, myself, am working. And here's the huge takeaway. 35 years after the crucifixion and resurrection, it remains for some to enter it. There remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. What is it? It is the full realization of the new covenant, the messianic kingdom, the messianic temple, the heavenly Jerusalem. And at the time Hebrews is written, it's just a few short years, less than five, until the destruction of Jerusalem, the temple, and the end of the old covenant era. That is when they would all enter. That is when entry was opened up to all people everywhere through faith. And that's when the promise was fulfilled and will, be con will continue to be filled throughout all time for those who embrace Jesus as the promised Messiah of Israel and Savior of the whole world through repentance and faith. Well, I'll be back here tomorrow morning and I hope you'll join with me as we pick up our study in Hebrews chapter 4 in this new covenant. Now, Don has been mentioning a sale throughout the month of August 2021. If you order over $25, he will give a 15% discount and free shipping for U.S. orders only. Now, you can go to his website at donkpreston.com or bibleprophecy.com. Now, I can't recommend his books enough to you, but if, you have, if you've never read We Shall Meet Him in the Air, The Wedding of the King of Kings, what are you waiting on? Order $25 online and receive a 15% discount and free shipping. Well, I invite you to join me on Musings of a Texas Preacher Man. I post a teaching four times each week on Monday through Thursday. I'll post a link on Facebook and Twitter, and if you click the subscribe button in the lower right corner of your screen, you'll be notified whenever I post a new video. And if you like these videos, well, I hope you'll click the like button and even share it with your friends on social media. Now remember, let Scripture interpret Scripture. Well, I hope you'll go out and make today a great day. Have a safe and blessed day. And I'll look forward to seeing you right here again.